The Whistler. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Tonight, transcribed, it's the Whistler's strange story, A Case for Mr. Carrington. As usual on Saturday afternoons, the veranda of the Myrtle Bank Hotel, Jamaica, was a gathering point for men in white linen suits whose only talk was of sugar 24 hours a day. But Gordon Stone, for once, wasn't thinking of sugar. The girl was too charming. The cool, wind-blown American beauty of her, too irresistible. He was admitting it to himself now. This wasn't just a passing thing with a summer tourist. He was in love. And he knew it. How's the drink? Wonderful. What is it? Myrtle Bank Punch. Specialty of the house. I'd enjoy it more under different circumstances. Oh, stop it, Paula. You're not going to leave Jamaica. You're going to stay. We're going to be married and everything will be... You're perfectly... wrong, Gordon. I'm sailing next week. Now, wait a minute. That's not giving me a chance. Paula, please, stick with me just a little while longer. These things can't be done in a day. It's been three months. It doesn't seem so complicated, Gordon. You own part of the sugar plantation. Sell it. Just like that? It would bring a lot of money. Not enough, Paula. The interests are all split up with Wakefield, his son Wade. Only 20% is mine. Are you asking me to work around You're not being until... fair, Paula. This is no time to desert me. Why, I'm almost ready now. I... What do you mean, almost ready? Why, to talk things over with old man Wakefield... He... Beg pardon, sir? Oh, yes? A message for you, Inspector Carrington, waiting for you at your house. Inspector Carrington? He's an old friend of Mr. Wakefield's, dear. Uh, you'd better tell the inspector that I... Never mind, Gordon. I must go anyway. All right, Paula. I'll, I'll get in touch with you. Goodbye. The rumble of thunder sounds overhead as you guide the car through the outskirts of town and down the road bisecting tall fields of cane on the flatlands of the north. And you wonder, Gordon, if Paula knows, if she suspects there's a reason for those accidental remarks of yours, that from the moment you first saw her, Jamaica became a prison, and the tense trap feeling inside you began to build like the storm overhead, and that now, with her final decision to leave you, it's got to break. Plantation, you brace yourself a little as you walk in to meet your guest. Hello, Inspector. Good afternoon, Gordon. Sorry, I kept you waiting. Oh, that's all right. Hated to pull you away from that charmer of yours. But it's rather important, I think. You're meeting with Wakefield this afternoon? Yes, in ten minutes, as a matter of fact. You know, of course, that the old boy's my closest friend. Went through Cambridge together and all that. And I'd hate to see anything happen. I... What do you mean? I, I'd never say this to him, Gordon, but frankly, I'm quite worried about his boy, Wade. I understand the two of them have almost come to blows on this hidden proposition. Wade wants to sell his interest. His father, of course, refuses to consider it. Well, it's a sort of chronic condition. No, it's more than that. I think I know human character, Gordon. To get to the point, I'm very much afraid that boy's liable to do something violent. You think it's that serious? It could be, easily. Wade is capable of anything. Such as? Killing his father, for example. Oh, come now, Inspector. Oh, I've seen it before, Gordon. I know that look. He's fully capable of murder. And above all, he's got the motive. Uh, incidentally, I see you have a copy of my book on homicide investigation. Yes, I've had it for some time. <laughs> a little out of date now. I wrote it in the 30s while I was at the yard in London. But there's one thing in it that'll be sound as long as there are human beings, Gordon. Given the motive, nine times out of ten, you've got the murderer. Now, Wade's got the motive, and I'm afraid... Now, don't worry, Inspector. I want you to look out for his father, Gordon. You're with him all the time, the two of you in business together, and so on. 
Well, you needn't say anything to him, of course, but... If you suspect that boy's up to anything, I want you to get in touch with my office at once. You see him to the door and then walk thoughtfully back into your study. Take his book on homicide investigation off the shelf. Flip the pages to a passage you've studied many times, underlined in red pencil. If there is one essential in the investigation of a homicide, it is the element of motive. Given the motive, nine times out of ten, you've got the murderer. Carrington's Creed, Gordon. And the key to your escape from the prison here. The open sesame to New York and Paula and the $300,000 in proceeds from the sale of the plantation that will come to you if old Mr. Wakefield, your partner, dies. And above all, the thing that will send his son Wade to the gallows for a crime that you committed. Your mind is made up now. There couldn't be a better time, Gordon. The storm, the inspector, it's going to happen tonight. Yes? Gordon? Yes, Mr. Wakefield. Wade is here. You'd better get over right away. Looks like I may need some help. I see. Yes, sir. I'll be right over. In just a minute, the whistler will continue tonight's story. All of us are proud of our hometowns, and rightly so. In this brief moment before we continue with our program, we'd like to offer a salute to one of our hometowns in America, New Orleans, Louisiana. It has a colorful and fascinating history that dates back to the year 1718 when the French founded it and named it in honor of the Duke of Orleans. Later, it was part of the Spanish Empire in America and became part of the United States under the terms of the Louisiana Purchase. Thus, New Orleans has been under three flags. As a memento of the old days, the city has a French quarter which holds a fascination for tourists and for gourmets. The narrow streets are crowned by the iron trellised balconies of quaint old dwellings and shops. The restaurants are world famous for their good food. New Orleans is sometimes called America's most interesting city, and it is a unique combination of the old world romance and modern progress. It is the greatest distribution center in the South and the second greatest port of the United States with its 11-mile system of state-owned and controlled docks along the riverfront. The Mississippi River is the heart of modern New Orleans industry. Everything centers about it. From its docks are shipped oil, sulfur, salt, molasses, sugar, and furs. Here comes much of the nation's trade with South America and on up the river to Chicago, to Canadian ports through the Great Lakes, and to New York through the Erie Canal. New Orleans is the gateway to some 15,000 miles of navigable waterways. The most spectacular and gayest festival in the United States is held in New Orleans, the Mardi Gras, which involves a week of carnival and reaches the climax on Shrove Tuesday, the day before the beginning of Lent. Whether it's a matter of pleasure or business, whether you admire the charm and grace of old world settings or the beauty of the modern city, New Orleans is proud of the part it has played in the building of America. And now, back to The Whistler. The downpour has turned the plantation road into a pair of muddy ruts as you slog in second gear toward Wakefield's big house on the high ground near the gate. And you're thinking now, Gordon, of the murder that will take place before the storm passes. Of a custom-built case for Mr. Carrington, with a motive so strong against young Wade Wakefield that he made a special trip to discuss it with you. You're thinking, too, of Paula and Fifth Avenue and dinner together at the Colony Club and a life in which sugar is simply something you put in coffee. As usual... There is a violent argument in progress between father and son when you arrive. Question, Wade. Do you understand plain English? Of course I understand English. I was brought up on it. 
but I can't understand stupidity. I've operated this plantation for 30 years without your help. Easy and now, I... Mr. Wakefield, easy. Oh. Oh, Gordon. You'd better run along, Mr. Stone. My father and I are having a private discussion. And maybe you'd better shut up. Uh, who do you think you're Did you hear what for? I said? Well, you're going to say it once too often, old boy. When that happens, let me know. <laughs> now, what is it? Oh, the same old thing. He wants to sell his 20% to Hedden. I thought we'd settle that. Well, you were wrong. And now that you're both here, I might as well tell you. Go on. I instructed your clerk yesterday afternoon to draw up the contract. Mr. Hedden and I have already had an understanding. What? The deal, in short, is made. Wait. I'm of age, Father. It's my interest, my money, and my decision. Get out of this house. Do you hear me? Get out. Oh, no, really. Don't you think you're being a little... Get out of man? here before I throw you out. <laughs> well, sorry to leave the old ancestral home. Oh, if you want me, I'll be staying down at the hotel. I'm sorry, Mr. Wakefield, that this had to happen. Uh, you'll have to excuse me, Gordon. I think I'd better lie down for a while. Yes? Gordon? Yes, Paula? I've been trying to get you for an hour. I wanted to tell you my sailing has been moved up. The boat leaves tomorrow night. Oh. You... You haven't... Listen to me, dear. I'm going to see you tomorrow. We, we can discuss it all You again. haven't told me, Gordon. Are you going to sell? I can't tell you now, Paula. I'm sorry. So am I. Goodbye. Dear. Paula. Paula! That's all right, Angel. You'll feel better tomorrow. It's three o'clock now, Gordon. Time still to run through it once again in your mind. Time to temper your weapons. Add weight to your legendary loyalty to Mr. Wakefield. Your obvious hatred of his son. At four, you're sitting at the bar in Wade's hotel waiting for him to appear. Talking to Sid Riggs, financial editor of the Kingston Express. Well, so the old man threw the boy out of the house, eh? I had no idea it would go that far. You just don't know Wade. No sense, no perspective. Hates his father like poison. Wade really? is absolutely unprince... Go on, Stone. Say it. Hello, Wade. I didn't see you come in. <laughs> Obviously. Not that it makes any difference. I've been waiting for Wait you. Wait a minute, Gordon. This is no place. There'll never be a better place, Sid. Stay out of this. What's eating you, Stone? If you had any sense yourself, I'd you'd... break your neck. Now listen, I've you taken listen. off. I want you to get out of town. Leave your father alone. What, so the two of you can go on running the company in the same old rut? Huh? Yes. If he wants it that way. What's your pitch, Stone? Where do you get off and when? There's got to be more to it than loyalty to a stubborn old man who... <laughs> oh, I... Another crack like that and I'll kill you. God, wait, now you cut it out. Leave him alone. If it's a fight he wants, I'll Stop give it, it to him. Stop. And call the police. You can't fight in my hotel. Now, come on, wait. Outside. Don't you feel that. This isn't settled yet. Stone, please, Mr. Stone, don't continue it. I can't say I blame you, but the other patrons... I know, I know. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Grayson. Oh, all right, all right. It's all over. Now, there's more drinks at the bar. Come now. Perhaps if we talked in the lobby, Mr. Stone? Of course, of course. I'm going anyway. I do hope you realize I understand your position in this. That young Wade... I know, of course. Uh, I wish he weren't staying here at all. Look, Mr. Grayson, as long as he is, you can do me a favor. Well, he upsets his father terribly. Any time you hear that he's calling or trying to see the old man, would you let me know? Uh, certainly. Well, thank you. And uh, I'm really sorry about what happened in there. Oh, it's all right, Mr. Stone. Gives them something to talk about over their drinks. But I hope it won't happen again. I hope it won't be necessary. Good night, Mr. Grayson. And you know that it won't be, don't you, Gordon? Because everything is fitting into place. At 8 o'clock, you pull up in front of the house, reach into your pocket for the copy of an old letter of agreement which you've been holding out until this very moment. 
you find Wakefield in his study. And as he reads the contract, you know exactly what his reaction will be. According to this, Wade can't sell out. Oh, Gordon, my boy, you're a wizard. An absolute wizard. <laughs> well, I thought there ought to be some out for you. It was just a matter of tracking this agreement down. You certainly found the answer. Oh, Wade can't make a move. He'd forgotten all this, eh? Yes, sir. Oh, will I enjoy telling that young... I pup. wouldn't be too hard on him, sir. After all... He's got he's to quite... learn. If he's ever going to be worth anything, he's got to learn. Uh, when are you going to talk to him, sir? Going to get him over here tonight. I'll uh, have him here within the hour. You know, I thought that's what you'd do, Mr. Wakefield. <laughs> Wouldn't you in my place? I think so, yes, sir. But there'll be words. Wade won't take this lying down. That's why I took a little liberty, sir. Oh? Yeah. I told your servants to take the rest of the evening off. You and Wade will have the house to yourself. <laughs> you can shout his head off. <laughs> oh, Gordon, you're wonderful. <laughs> I made no mistake taking you in as a partner. The drive across the plantation to your own quarters is pleasant, isn't it, Gordon? In spite of the mounting wrath of the storm, there's a tense, expectant feeling, some nervousness, but not enough to destroy the excitement. It's going so well. If there were any doubt, that Wade would come out to his father's house. It's a race. As you let yourself in and fumble across the storm-darkened room to answer your insistently ringing phone. Hello? Uh, Mr. Stone? Speaking. Uh, this is Grayson at the hotel. Uh, Mr. Stone, you asked me to call about Wade. What about him? His father telephoned a while ago from the place out there. Shortly after that, Wade left. Uh, I'm sure that's where he's going. I see. I hope there isn't anything to be alarmed about. But the way he rushed out of here and all... You did the right thing, Grayson. I'm glad you called. I'll get right over to the other house. I don't believe you can get there before he does, Mr. Stone. I've been... I'll do my best, Grayson. Don't worry about it. You hang up, smiling, knowing that your timing is almost perfect. But you'll have to hurry, Gordon. Wade can't leave that house before you arrive. You've got to murder Wakefield only a few moments after the two men argue and Wade drives off, heading back to town. Yes, you've got to go through with the one thing that can bring you and Paula together. Grinding over the rain-soaked road, you hope that you haven't already delayed too long. A few moments later, angry voices, barely discernible through the storm, tell you that the argument between Wade Wakefield and his father has reached its height. You stand, straining to listen, watching the house, wishing that the storm hadn't cut off the light. Then you draw back as the house becomes silent. You watch tensely. A moment later, a figure slips out the side door. And you hear Wade's car start up. And you know that he's walked out on his father once again, that he's heading back to town. It's simpler than you planned, isn't it, Gordon? Knowing the two of them so well makes it almost mechanical. You even know where to find Wakefield in the dark house. You swing onto the veranda, climb easily up to the bedroom window where he's certain to be lying down, exhausted from his own anger. You peer in cautiously. See him on the bed, moving restlessly. Slowly, you ease the window up. Lean into the room slightly. Take careful aim at the sleeping figure of old Mr. Wakefield on the bed. <laughs> we'll be together, Paula. Sooner than you think. Don't be half right. Use USAFI. For example, if you're interested in raising bees, how many different species would you say there are? 750? No, that's only half right. Brush up on your zoology. Tell your I and E officer you want to study with the United States Armed Forces Institute, USAFI. It's easy. It's simple. If you don't want to be half right, use USAFI. And now back to 
The Whistler. Well, Gordon, the case for Mr. Carrington is complete now. It's simple, isn't it? So simple that the lowliest amateur in Kingston can add up the facts. Come to the conclusion that Inspector Carrington must inevitably reach. That Wade Wakefield, furious with frustration, shot and killed his own father. As the minutes tick by, you pace the floor of the old man's study. Glance up occasionally at the door to the upstairs bedroom the room which holds the key to all your plans, to Paula, and New York, and freedom. It's only 25 minutes since you call the inspector and describe young Wade's crime, when a car pulls up and you hear footsteps on the porch. Oh, come right in, inspector. You better come with me, Gordon, upstairs. I think the door's locked. Never mind, I have the key. Hmm. Dead, all right. Shot through the head. Yes, it's just as I told you on the phone. I saw Wade raise the gun and... A flash of lightning illuminates the room. And you get a good look at the body on the bed. Your knees buckle as it hits you. Of all the men in Kingston, Gordon, of all the men in the world, you've managed to kill the one man against whom, in the eyes of Inspector Carrington, you had a solid motive. But Mr. Wakefield was... Wakefield's waiting outside in the car. They quarreled. Wade fell and struck his head. His father brought him up here before going for the doctor. Wade. It was Wade. Yes, it was Wade you shot. Funny, isn't it, Gordon? Only this afternoon I was telling you, given the motive. And who had a better motive to kill young Wade than you? Now, a question. Do you know the origin of the expression, not enough room to swing a cat? Contrary to popular belief, the expression has nothing to do with a four-legged house pet. In the very early days of the Navy, when crews became difficult to handle after many months at sea, the cat and nine tails was often used. But when this form of punishment was used below decks, the low beam ceilings prevented the cat and nine tails from being used with any degree of force. In other words, there wasn't enough room to swing a cat. Though such cruel form of discipline disappeared long ago, the expression still remains in our vocabulary. This is but one of many interesting facts which can be found in the history of your United States Navy. Featured in tonight's transcribed story were Bill Foreman as the Whistler, Paul Duvall, Gene Tatum, Larry Dobkin, Eric Snowden, Jack Moyles, and Jack Edwards. The Whistler, directed by Gordon T. Hughes, with music by Wilbur Hatch, is produced by Joel Malone and transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Tonight's Whistler was written by Joel Malone and Harold Swanton. The Whistler was entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarities of names or resemblances to persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is George Walsh speaking and reminding you to listen again next week for another strange tale by The Whistler. The Whistler.